Hi, I'm Corey Wayne, and today we're going to talk about inflation and rising food prices. Obviously, this is affecting everybody because everybody's going to the supermarket, and literally, it seems like every week you go, things are getting more and more expensive. And so, we're going to look at what the stats are, and then talk about what's causing it. It's it's a more nuanced explanation than just saying, "Well, I just printed." trillions of dollars in the last few years or 50% of all money in circulation was printed in the last couple of years. So it will be interesting. So we're going to go through some stats and we have one of our resident journalists, Estefania, who's going to enlighten us. So Esty, tell us, what are the facts? What are the facts? What's the fact, Jack? Hmm. Well, the U.S. inflation is high. That's why it's causing food prices to increase. So before we get into the rising food prices, let's get into the inflation rate. So the U.S. inflation surges at highest rate since 1982. This is more than 40 years, 30, 50 years we're talking about. So according to this article that I found, it says U.S. inflation rose in December at the fastest rate in nearly 40 years as price gains spread beyond a few pandemic disrupted categories to such areas as shelter costs. Meaning the, housing. Correct. The Labor Department reported Wednesday, January 19th, that the Consumer Price Index CPI increased 7% last month on a year to year basis, matching economists' expectations. It was the biggest CPI gain since June 1982 and the third straight monthly jump of more than 6%, excluding the often volatile categories of energy and food. Core inflation rose 5.5%, the highest rate since 1991. In December, prices for autos, furniture, and other durable goods continue to drive much of the infla inflationary surge with prices of used cars and trucks soaring 37.3%. Gasoline prices fell 0.5% in December from November, but food inflation remains elevated, rising 0.5%. Rental inflation increased 4.1%, the highest rate since 2007, and restaurant meals were more expensive, indicating the impact of higher wages. I know this particular place went up 10%. Some of my neighbors were saying their rent went up 20% because the building is full. Because I live down here in South Florida and you got all the people from the blue states moving to the red states because we're, for the most part, pretty much open, even though we still have a few mass communists around chasing everybody trying to put the paper masks on everybody. Hmm. Well, with this information of the inflation rate going up tells a lot of what's going on with food prices. And the rise of food prices are leading to American consumers to fill their shopping carts with cheaper groceries. Which tends to mean that they're eating more processed foods and stuff that's not healthy that's basically going to make you gain a lot of weight because it's full of sugar and process things and stuff that's just basically not good for you. And so the people that are going to be affected the most are going to be the middle class and poor people because now that everything's more expensive, they're in essence having to buy poor quality food. But there are supermarkets that have cheap meats. For example, I shop at Sedano's. You can get meat, chicken or ground chicken for like four bucks, five bucks compared to Publix who raises the prices to 8 to 10 bucks, correct? The question is, where does that food come from? Well, it's supposed to come from wherever they're getting it. It's all, it's fresh. I had no issues, so I don't know. Well, as far as you know, but it's like the feed that goes into raising those chickens. Typically, if they're selling it for cheaper, they're probably feeding the chickens some lower quality food. Even though it's the same brand. That Publix and Sedano's Same use. exact brand. So you're saying Publix is marketing up double? Yes. Huh. I didn't know that. I guess I was corrected by the journalist. Well, I've seen it when I've shopped at Sedano's. I like to shop at Sedano's and I got cheaper stuff. Same things that I could get from Publix. I don't shop at Publix because it's super expensive. Or go to Walmart. Walmart has the same thing, cheaper, just like Sedano's. And it has the same brand as Publix. Well, Publix is where shopping is a pleasure. Will be. 
Moving on to the next bullet point, shoppers are seeking more discounts. Switching to lower cost stores, therefore, as I said, Sedano's, um, cooking oil brands, frozen foods, and other items. Many shoppers are signing up for saving programs such as automatic delivery that gives additional discounts. So everyone is turning into the discounts and thinking, well, they know that's going to help them for expenses. Now, this is coming straight from the article. The move marks a shift in consumer behavior after shoppers splurged on food earlier in the pandemic. Food companies have said that unemployment benefits and federal stimulus checks left people with extra cash and that consumers spend more on groceries as it cut back on dining out and travel in 2020. As inflation reaches its highest rate in four decades, shoppers in recent months have started looking for ways to lower their food bills, industries, executives, and analysts said. Some shoppers cut extra expenses such as nails, hair, and lash appointments to save money for food. Several shoppers noticed an increase for meat, vegetables, and beverages. The U.S. Labor Department's Consumer Price Index, which tracks the cost of consumer goods and services, climbed 7% in December from the same month in 2020, the fastest pace since 1982. The Food at Home Index rose 6.5% in 2021, the largest over the year-year increase in 2008. The index for meats, poultry, fish, and eggs increased 12.5% from 2020 to 2021, while fruits, vegetables, cereal, and bakery products were also more expensive. More price increases are coming. Major food suppliers, including Mondelez International Incorporation, General Mills Incorporation, and Campbell, Incorporated. Incorporated. I wasn't an English major. And uh, and Campbell Soup Company said they plan further increases to take effect in January, following others that food companies implemented last year. Industry implemented. I- implemented last year, which was said. Industries such as consumer products and manufacturing also have charged more for goods, citing higher wage, transportation, and material costs. And people are turning to pantries for this. So if you guys saw our economic prosperity for all documentary where we go through and we talk about the expansion and the contraction of the money supply. So what we had over the last few years with all the coronavirus response from the government is you had the government basically borrowing trillions of dollars more in debt and then spending it in the economy. And what's interesting to me, my my perspective, my opinion on all this is that the Democrats have been pushing for like a $15 an hour minimum wage for years. And so people who were making seven, eight, nine, ten bucks an hour when the pandemic happened and they got furloughed, they were making a lot more money to stay at home. They were making more than their hourly wage. In essence, the government paid them 15 bucks and I think it was like five or 600 bucks a week if I remember right that people were getting which they're getting paid more to not work and then so when things started reopening back up they're like hey come back to work they're like I can just you know I can just stay on unemployment and make more money doing nothing and so a lot of people chose to do that because a lot of the restaurants and places that I I frequent down in South Florida. Many of them were not being able to open for lunch because they they couldn't find workers to work. And so what you have is you have the government, in essence, basically paying people more to stay home than they would make working for somebody else. And if you're a restaurant or retail or any kind of employer where you're depending on minimum wage style wages to pay your employees – You've artificially inflated the cost of wages because the government is now paying people more to stay home and do nothing than they could earn work for somebody else. So what that does is it forces all the employers who need those low hourly wage workers, you got to pay more now just to get them to stop sitting at home in essence. Now, granted, a lot of the unemployment ran out when the, the states started opening back up, but in a lot of the blue states – 
they kept paying these people more to stay home and it's decimated especially like the restaurant and the service industry a lot of these restaurants went out of business and they're not coming back and then klaus schwab says that well these businesses weren't resilient enough and so what you have is a government in essence has interfered in the economy and paid people more than they were making in the market which forced everybody that was paying those wages to have to pay more because it's the only way they could get employers to do the work. And it's pretty simple. If as a business owner, your expenses go up, you have to pass that on to your customer. And so when you think about people that process, that work in the fields, the farmers, the people that work in the meat processing plants, the people that cut up your chicken breast and take it off the body of the of the chicken and wrap it up all nice so when you see it in the store now you're having to pay more for those people to do it so your expenses as a food producer are going to go up and you're going to pass that on to the consumer the people buying your meats which is like the grocery stores or the restaurants and so now food is more expensive and so everybody's got to pay more for food and so the restaurant that you're frequenting not only is the food costing them more that they're buying, they're having to pay raise the, the wages that they're paying the dishwashers and the cooks and everybody else. You say, oh, well, that's great for them because now they make more money. But not really because now the price of everything goes up. And so those low to minimum wage type jobs are now all a lot more expensive and all those, you know, that all gets passed on to the consumer. And so this reminds me a lot of what happened in the 1970s when I was growing up when you had OPEC putting their oil embargoes on. And because back then cars were, would get like two to three miles a gallon. They had big engines. They wasted a lot of gas because gas was like cost nothing back then. It was, you know, 30, 40 cents a gallon, I think it, what it was back, back in the day. And then now all of a sudden those cars are getting two or three miles a gallon with the restriction in the supply of gasoline because at the time traditional drilling the american oil fields were declining in production so that's when like saudi arabia and all these other gulf states really started pulling their oil out of the ground because it was really high grade oil that was cheap to produce and so therefore they raised rates and so because the cost of gas went up gas powers everything it powers uh, or oil i should say kerosene that power powers jet airplanes comes from oil gasoline for cars comes from oil diesel that powers the diesel locomotives and the 18 wheelers all the gas so basically what runs the economy is oil this is back in the 70s and so now the oil costs more everybody that uses oil or power in some form or another is now paying more for gas and so all that gets passed on to the consumers and so that's when you had Toyota and Nissan and uh, there was one other automaker I can't think of right now that were like the big ones back in the 70s. They started producing those uh, four-cylinder cars that got a lot more miles to the gallon than those big gas-guzzling American cars. And so that you know, so what we saw, we saw high inflation and I think it was Paul Volcker was the chairman of the Federal Reserve bank at the time they started raising interest rates and so like we discussed in economic prosperity for all you raise the interest rates you increase the cost of borrowing for everybody that wants to borrow money and so people do their numbers based on what their interest expense is going to be and so based on the interest expense going up it made projects and investments less financially feasible so they simply didn't borrow the money and when they did that that restricted the money supply and circulation in the economy. And obviously Jimmy Carter suffered tremendously because of that because the economy went in the shitter and everybody blamed him. And then Ronald Reagan came in saying, hey, we're going to loosen things up. Then he ended up dropping the interest rates and doing cutting taxes, doing things that basically increased the money supply and circulation in the economy. So the economy took off. And uh, they, they call it the, the decade of decadence. Wasn't that what we, we call it back in the day? Decade of dec decadence back in the 1980s. Miami, Miami Vice, everything was very, very glitzy. And 
But then the bill came due. And so when George Bush Sr. was in office, the policies that were instituted constricted the money supply and circulation. And then everybody said, well, George Bush sucks at running the economy. And then so Bill Clinton got elected president. And then the banking system dropped rates, increased the money supply and circulation. The economy did better. Bill Clinton said, I did that. And in reality, we're, we're kind of in the same situation now. The economy was booming under Trump, and then they printed all, all of this money. They artificially inflated the labor market because they were paying people more money to stay home and not do anything. So therefore, everybody had to pay workers more just to get them to come to work. And so the prices – so even though people are, are earning more per hour, everything is more expensive. So they, they as far as their – Standard of living, it didn't get any better. And so what you see a lot in the news and in the media is that all this money printing is what caused the problem. Well, that's, that's true, but there's nuances to it because you have to look where does the money go. Like what we saw 2007, 2008, where all that money was going into real estate back when I was in, in real estate. And so you, it's a supply and demand issue. So if you've got a high supply of money chasing a limited supply of real estate, then you're going to see an inflation in the value of real estate. And then what the Fed did was to slow the economy because, I mean, I, I remember within a year, there were houses that we were – because our normal sales price, our average sales price was like 189.9 for most of the first-time buyers, people that were buying homes for, from us. And so within about six, eight-month period, those same homes were now $300,000. And so a lot of our buyers got priced out of the market. And so the Fed started raising the rates to slow the economy, to slow the creation and expansion of the money supply. And so then the pendulum swung back the other way, and it created a domino effect to where it stalled the housing market. And so you had a lot of people buying, especially like the Nina, no income, no asset loans. They call them liars loans. Yeah, I mean, you had people buying those and doing stated income where they had good credit, but they could just say they made whatever. And as long as they had the credit to qualify or they had bank statements to show that money was getting deposited every month, they qualified for the loan. And so when all the cheap money goes away and the interest rates start going up, you have less people buying homes. And so now what that did by increasing the interest rate is you had fewer people buying homes. And so now the supply of buyers started de to decline. And yet you have these inflated, artificially inflated values of homes that now you have less buyers. And so what's going to happen is the homes started depreciate or started going down in value. And that just created a domino effect. Plus, you had a lot of the loans where they were adjustable rate mortgages, where your fixed rate for two, first two or three years, and the interest rate was tied to the prime or the LIBOR rate, which stands for London Interbank Offered Rate. And so what happens is the interest expense goes up on these homes to buy them or, or the people that are in them. They get their, you know, with the Fed raising the rates, I think three or four times in, in one that one particular era, I think it was like 2005 or six, whenever it was in that, or maybe it was 2004 in that window, then what happens is people's monthly payment, because the idea was they would stay in the home for two to three years, clean their credit up, pay their mortgage on time, and then they could easily refinance at a lower fixed rate mortgage in a few years. And what happened was the interest rate was high. They no longer qualified to get a loan in the house that they were living in. And so with the interest rate going up and their monthly payment going up, they can no longer afford to make their mortgage payment. So they just started walking away from the homes or they started short selling the homes. And so what happened was for new home builders, the demand for – I remember these new home builders, they, when they first would open these developments, oh, we got 600 lots, we got 1,000 lots, you know, please come to our open house, bring your buyers, we'll give you discounts, we'll do this, we'll do that. And then I remember about a year later, those same people, they weren't even returning our phone calls. They were having lotteries. So if they were like, hey, we got 500 lots and we got 2,000 people that want to buy in here. So put your name in and we'll draw, draw the first 500 names and then you get the privilege of buying those lots. And with us being an outside realtor wanting to come in and bring our buyers, they would have to pay us a 3% commission. 
But because there were so many people in the market buying, they started being dicks to us. And they were very arrogant. I was like, we don't need you realtors. We've got all these lots sold. And so, but when the rates got, the interest rates got raised, all those buyers went away. And those same assholes, just a matter of months later, were calling us, begging us to come to their happy hours and their their parties and because they were desperately trying to sell these homes. And so when the homes aren't selling, you're going to stop building homes. If you stop building homes, the people that are earning money to build those homes, the supply companies are supplying all the raw materials and the furniture, fixtures, equipment, the electrical, switch gear, all that stuff that goes into building a home, all that stuff stopped. And so the people that were like going, they were living paycheck to paycheck when they lose their jobs, they're the first one to default in the mortgages. And so you had a high default rate. And because so many mortgages defaulted, it created a domino effect in the economy. And a lot of the lenders that we had been working with, they all went out of business because their default rate went up so high. And it was because the Fed raised the rates too fast. And even Alan Greenspan, I talked about this in Mastering Yourself, he didn't realize how much subprime money was out there. And so when they jacked the interest rates up, they basically created a domino effect that crashed the economy. And it took a decade to recover from that. It's only in the last few years that the properties that got artificially inflated 12, 15 years ago have finally started to recover. But now the, the Fed has just said that they're going to raise rates four times in the next 12 months. And I look at that and it's like, phew, they're going to create another economic crash and it's going to go through and wipe out people. Because you have this, when you look back, I mean, it's like every 10 to 15 years, you get the boom and the bust cycle. And so that's what's happening now. It's like, it looks like we're going into a bust cycle. So because interest rates are going up, you're going to have fewer people borrowing and therefore fewer loans being created. The money supply is going to contract. And when the money supply contracts, so does the economy. And so the things that have inflated will start to deflate. And it, it, it looks like they haven't learned anything from what happened and because it's all they're kind of trying to gauge things and guess but when you raise the rates you don't really get the full effect of that interest rate change for 12 24 36 months before you really see the impact on the economy and more than likely they're going to raise rates too fast and they're going to crash the economy again and then we'll be back in a bus cycle and the economy will be in the shitter and a lot of people will that have already had their lives wrecked financially over the last several years while the lockdowns now are going to get wrecked financially because the economy sucks. So I'm not happy about any of this because this is not good for my stocks. They haven't been doing too well lately and it's not good for my crypto. And so the people are just saying, well, we printed all this money and that's why. Well, it's true that it's because of all the new money, but it's like, where did the money go? And so the, like in 2007, 2008, the cash went into the real estate market. So you had artificial inflation of real estate. This time, you have artificial inflation of the labor market. And so now everybody is paying more. And so if everybody gets laid off or gets fired or unemployment goes through the roof again, then the businesses, because there'll be a surplus of labor, like I, I remember after, uh, it was like the September 11th attacks, I think it was, and you, you saw a big change. There was like a big washout of like IT people. I had people with like master's degrees applying for like a $10 or $15 an hour job to be our IT person just to fix our computers when, when things broke. I had people literally master's degrees and just a, literally months before they've been making 80, 100 grand a year. And our phone was ringing off the hook with these way overqualified people that had lost their jobs. And so these are the kinds of things you see. And so the pendulum swings back the other way. And so all these people that are, are, are these wages that are being paid, it's gonna, it'll start declining. But it's going to be messy. I think you know we're in – I was hoping we can't come out of this thing. But now with the Fed raising the rates like they are four times in the next year, that's not going to be good for the economy. It's going to crash it again. And we won't really see the effects for about another year and a half, two, maybe three years. So I'm not happy about that. Things are going great. But it is what it is. If more people understood the boom-bust cycle, if more people understood what we talked about in economic prosperity for all, we could actually elect leaders that were competent and knew what they were doing. And I look at this, it, it just looks like they're doing it on purpose. Like they're 
purposely going to wreck the economy because when people are broke and they're hungry, they and then the government comes in, oh, I got the solution. Here's some unemployment. Hey, just vote for me. And so the politicians are able to get get more power. Const- I mean, you look at the lockdowns, everything happened in the last two years. One of the guys I follow on Twitter, he said it was the fastest roll-up of power in history. So now, because when people are hurting economically, socialism, communism, all those things sound like great ideas. And so the pendulum will swing that way. So in the next year or two, you'll have a bunch of politicians talking about government handouts to help all the people that are out of work because of a problem that the government and the bankers created, and Wall Street for that matter. It's going to be good times. Are you concerned for the prices of food increasing or no? Well, of course, but I just but, explained why like, that's happened. But the food will start to go back down because what will happen is people won't be able to afford the stuff, so they're not going to buy it. No, you personally. For you, when it doesn't, you go, Honestly, it doesn't affect me. What is usually like the supermarket you will like shop at? Well, Whole Foods, Publix. So you never done like Fresco's, Walmart, Sedano's? I care about convenience. So, but people are living paycheck to paycheck. Yeah, they're they're going to suffer. But like I said, you crash the economy, you're going to have all these people out of work. They're going to be desperate for work, and so the wages will. You'll get a, a deflation in the wages because the money supply is now starting to contract. So it's going to be terrible for the stock market. It's going to be terrible for crypto. It'll stabilize at some point, but. I mean, after what we just went through the last two years, now you're going to get hammered from the other side with a fucked up economy. And you have all these millions of businesses, that you know, small businesses that got destroyed. So the big companies like the Walmarts, they have less competition because all those – because they weren't considered an essential business and they were shut down. And they end up shutting down permanently. This is how the government and the oligarchs and the people in power just can – it's the boom-bust cycle. It's just – you look back over 100 years, again, we went through this in economic prosperity for all. It's, it's, it's happened so many times since the Federal Reserve came into existence and it's happened again. You just got to understand the, how to ride the wave. The idea is you buy when nobody else is buying. You might want to make the point about how – Carnegie's quote about the time to buy is when, when there's oh, yeah. in the streets and the elite are able to buy up all the assets. At a, at yeah, that's what I was price. getting to. So, like, I think it was Carnegie said that the best time to buy, or maybe it was Rockefeller. No, it was, was J.P. Pierpont. It was uh, J.P. Morgan? J.P. Morgan, yeah. So I don't know if it's J.P. Morgan or one of those old oligarchs back from the turn of the century said that you buy when there's blood in the streets. In other words, when there's chaos and nobody – it's just like in real estate. The time to buy in real estate is when nobody wants the real estate. The, the time to buy up stocks is when most people have sold and the market is really low. So the oligarchs, the people with money, they're, they're going to they're gonna dramatically increase their fortunes. And then the – the politicians, the Bernie Sanders and the Liz Warrens will complain that all these – the rich aren't paying their fair share and demonize rich people. But when you look at the laws that actually get passed, it doesn't actually affect the ultra-wealthy people because their money is all in a trust. And they earn a small salary from the trust. The trust owns their cars. The trust owns their houses. The trust owns their businesses. The trust owns their stocks. And so they pay pay a very – you know, they take a small salary to, to pay their basic bills, but they don't technically own anything. And that's never talked about in the news. You don't ever hear Bill Gates or Warren Buffett talk about this. They just go on and like, you know, Warren Buffett goes, I pay less taxes than my secretary. It's okay, we'll take all your assets out of your trust and pay taxes on what you earn, you fucking smart ass. They, they don't ever talk about that. And so the politicians go, we got to raise taxes. And so the people that get their taxes raised are like the football players or the normal people that are making six figures. It ain't, it ain't the oligarchs. It ain't the Warren Buffetts of the world. They're not getting affected or the, or the Walton family. They're not getting affected. They're getting richer because their money is in a trust. But again, if the news actually did their fucking jobs, which they never do because they're incompetent and stupid and useless, they would explain these things. And so you have politicians and people on TV just use this to sway people because almost 100% of the people, including most of the people in our government, have no idea how the economy or the financial system works. 
And then they demonize capitalism. They say, capitalism sucks. Capitalism ain't the problem. It's the rigged market capitalism is the problem. It's the, punny, the people that are affecting the money supply, the bankers, the people on Wall Street, the ones that are interfacing with the politicians and getting the politicians to vote for the things they want. They're the ones that are wrecking things. But it'll get blamed on other people. Just like the housing crash was blamed on uh, the real estate appraisers and the evil mortgage brokers when it was Wall Street, when it was the banking system that fucked it up. Yeah.